Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center, to a director's forum uh, featuring the uh, president of the Republic of Lithuania, Valdas Adamkus, who will be uh, talking about security mm -hmm. and insecurity in the EU neighborhood and beyond in search of solutions. Uh, I am uh, Martin Sletzinger, director of East European Studies program <coughs> here at the Wilson Center, and it is my pleasure to welcome uh, um, President Adamkus uh, to the Wilson Center. In addition to our esteemed uh, speaker, <coughs> we are very pleased uh, to welcome other distinguished guests, including Lithuanian Foreign Minister Petras Vaitakunas, Member of Parliament Václav Stankevich, <coughs> Ambassador Andreas Bruska, and uh, Cornelia Jorgaitina, Charge de d'Affaires of the Lithu Lithuanian Embassy in, in the U.S., as well as uh, Ambassador John Cloud, U.S. Ambassador to uh, Lithuania. Uh, the Wilson Center, just to give you a, a word about uh, our, uh, what we do and what we don't do, uh, we serve as this nation's living memorial to Woodrow Wilson to honor this uh, man of ideas, <coughs> the nation's only uh, president to hold a PhD and very likely the only one ever to do so and uh, I think we can you can put money on it but any of it the United States Congress determined to memorialize this uh, fascinating uh, and unique president <coughs> with an institution of advanced research not merely a monument of marble here at the Wilson Center we bridge the worlds of scholarship and policy by bringing together the thinkers and the doers the academics, policymakers, journalists, business people, and scientists in a robust dialogue on the key issues of the day. And uh, it is now my uh, personal privilege to introduce the, the noted statesman, <coughs> President Valdas Adamkus, and to say a few words about him, if you don't mind. I'm sure they're all true, uh, although I can't vouch for that. You know, that's a, uh, uh, Valdas Adamkus was born uh, into a family of civil servants in Kaunas, Lithuania. During World War II, he and his family fled uh, to Germany and eventually settled in the United States. In 1960, he graduated from the Illinois Institute of Technology with a degree in civil engineering. A few years after graduating, Valdas Adamkus was invited to work at the newly established Environmental Protection Agency, uh, actually, which is uh, housed in this building as well, by the way, uh, where he headed the uh, Environment uh, Research Center and was later appointed Deputy Minister of the Midwest Region. In 1981, he was promoted to administrator of the EPA. Uh, President Adamkus was active in the public and political life of uh, the Lithuanian expatriate community <coughs> here in the United States throughout his career and has held numerous leadership positions in these expatriate organizations. Since Le Lithuania gained its independence in 1991, uh, President Adamkus has been active in fostering the reconstruction of Lithuanian democracy and its economic development. In his capacity as the <coughs> coordinator of U.S. assistance to the Baltic states in the field of environmental protection, President Adamkus organized study visits for representatives, representatives of Lithuania's academic institutions and helped Vilnius University to gain access to the latest academic literature and educational resources. In 1998, Valdas Adamkus was elected president of the Republic of Lithuania, and during his tenure, he worked consistently towards Romania, uh, Lithuania's, excuse me, uh, rapid modernization. Uh, now, uh, that was not a Freudian slip, it was just a slip <laughs> of the tongue. Uh, following the removal of uh, uh, Rolandus Paxis uh, from the office of president in 2004, Valdas Adamkus was re-elected to the office of president. Now serving in a second term, President Adamkus is committed to bring every Lithuanian household <coughs> to a European standard of living and to guarantee that the Lithuanian state is responsive <coughs> to every person in Lithuania. And now I give the floor to President Adamkus. Hopefully when he is finished giving his presentation, we'll have a few minutes left over for question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And definitely, it is a great pleasure and at the same time the privilege to speak at your international center. And let me begin that stating that I truly respect and admire the work of this institution that bridged the gap between the wonderful world of ideas and the material world of policy making. It is the mission that was crucial when 
So many years, 90 years ago, President Wilson declared a war to end all the wars and embarked on his lifetime venture to change the world and make it safe for democracy. It is an even more vital task today in the age of breathtaking innovations and economic inequalities that tempt some political and business leaders to put moral values, tolerance, responsibility, and solidarity on a back burner. I am also delighted to meet here this distinguished group of people, scholars, diplomats, politicians, who share a genuine interest in transatlantic security affairs. Two days ago, I had a thought-provoking discussion at the World Affairs Council in San Francisco. Being your guest here today, I will also have a unique opportunity to compare foreign policy thinking in the East and West Coast in the United States, and definitely this is going probably to help me by meeting President George Bush on Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, the world as you know it today is rapidly changing. We witness a rise of new military and economic powers. We trace the <coughs> nearly invisible threats posed by the international terror networks and see new dividing lines between democracies and audited, audited, audited authoritarian regimes. On the other hand, two things remain the same. Grave threats for global security and the necessity to think and act globally in response. Without our common actions, peace and stability will be in deficit around the world, divided by the haves and have-nots of the inter-universal right to security and development. And this is a good point to start my today's speech on transatlantic security policy issues in the EU Eastern Neighborhood and beyond. The end of the World War brought the world a new wave of democracies in the East of Europe, but it did not bring a lasting peaceful solution. Security in a region that neo-realists like to call a geopolitical buffer between Europe and Russia, and liberals prefer to call a strategic gateway and a meeting place between East and West is not yet a finished business. From the Gulf of Finland to the Black and Caspian Seas, a complex set of geopolitical and internal factors still constrain the development of civil societies. The threats of terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, infectious diseases, drug and human trafficking go hand in hand with the classic threats posed by frozen conflicts in such places as Transnistria, Abkhazia, or Nagorno-Karabakh. And this is despite the astounding success of NATO and EU enlargements. What is obvious to me that all these regional security challenges cannot be successfully confronted by a single country, a single region, or even a single powerhouse such as the United States or the European Union. From the perspective of Lithuania, a country that builds its security around NATO and European Union, the most important thing is to never stop asking and adjusting to new security challenges. The essential question, which I believe has been repeatedly posed in this hall, is a very simple one. How can transatlantic community work together to make the region and the world more secure? 
How can we strengthen our institutions to meet the no, known and new challenges without being too much surprised? What leadership qualities and new security partnerships will it require? The answers to these questions should be worked out as quickly as possible, and they should be based on transatlantic consensus. If we do not agree on a common vision and do not support it by joint action, I am afraid we will become a part of someone else's vision, a vision that might resemble the nightmare scenarios we are reluctant even to think about. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking about the lessons he had learned in the years of serving as General Secretary of the United Nations, Kofi Annan said that his first lesson was that the security of every one of us was linked to that of everyone else. This morning, I would like to discuss on three inter interrelated security challenges that have strategic importance for transatlantic community. First, what should we do together to modernize NATO and make it strong and relevant for future missions? How could we take advantage of the Alliance as a beacon of democracy? and peace. I believe it is a top priority to continue building on a legacy of NATO as the alliance of values. And I will be happy to present Lithuania's view on this. Second, how should we frame a new transatlantic dialogue in an era where previously peripheral issues suddenly occupy the center of our attention. How can we best match European and American means to strengthen the existing and building new global security partnership? Third, what efforts should we take towards the creation of a transatlantic energy policy? What policy should we adopt towards Russia, a country that is absolutely critical in addressing our energy needs, a neighbor whose particip participation is vital for sustaining non-proliferation efforts, finding solutions for en environmental problems, and consolidating democracy in a Black Sea region. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to take the NATO question first. It is the world's greatest democratic security alliance, and we would certainly prefer to see it like this for many years to come. But NATO is once again at the crossroads, as it was eight years ago before embarking on its historical enlargement of Eastern Europe. Today's challenge are not fundamentally different from the past ones yet they are deeply essential for the future of the Alliance. As conventional wisdom goes, NATO has to become global or go out of business. The Alliance now has mission far beyond the borders of its member states and prepares for operations that require skills of <coughs> engagement different from those we had faced before. Yet building on global partnership, NATO at the same time has to remain strong about its initial goals, values, and members' solidarity. In this respect, the outcome of Afghanistan will matter greatly to the future of NATO. And as Senator Lugar Luger rightly pointed out at the Riga summits, where I had the pleasure to listen to him, he said that Afghanistan has become a test case for whether we can overcome the growing discrepancy between expanding missions and lagging capabilities. 
And this is why it is so important that everybody accepts responsibility for its success. Lithuania plays its part in leading the provincial re reconstruction team in Goro province, building a trust and providing help for the local population. With relatively small resources available, we plan to send our special forces to Afghanistan's troublesome south. We believe it is not only the size but the solidarity between partners that matters. In many ways, young democracies like Lithuania have a deep appreciation for what the Alliance always stood for. NATO became one of the value-ridden cornerstones of Lithuania's foreign policy, even before its membership. I think this explains why Lithuania and other newcomers to the Alliance have eagerly responded to the US-led coalition of 48 willing nations to take part in a reconstruction of post-war Iraq. It is only on the basis of commitments to NATO that Lithuania will be able to strengthen its own and regional security. While NATO cannot possibly be a solution for all security problems, it should remain the basis for transatlantic actions around the world. I also think that the United States must encourage the European Union to play a bigger role in security matters. America needs the EU as a strong partner if the enlarged NATO is to remain successful. That is why we stand for European security and defense policy that would complement our commitments to NATO. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> now there is also the issue of NATO's new enlargement, or as we know it, an open door policy. It reminds me of a joke that we used to tell while waiting for our membership invitation. And we said, if you stand at the open door for too long, you can catch cold. I believe that say probably is still valid even in the present situation. Now there is also the issue of NATO's new enlargement. And looking back at NATO's last enlargement, we have to remember how controversial it looked for many in academia and government alike. But today even Russia speaks of it as a success story. If all previous enlargement enhanced stability in Europe, why should this one be different? The prospect of membership alone encourages reforms, settles borders, and extends liberal values. It also prevents the emergence of instability and provides the alliance with enhanced capabilities beyond its borders. Therefore, enlargement should be a part of the alliance's modernization agenda. And I strongly support those aspirants that work hard to prepare for NATO membership responsibilities. As soon as they meet the criteria, Croatia, Macedonia, and Albania should join the alliance to make an important contribution. There are also aspirants in the East, and I wish to highlight the case of Georgia, which has become a role model for political reforms in the South Caucasus. There is also Ukraine that continues doing its homework for membership. So serious efforts should be made to inform the general public in Ukraine about what NATO stands for. I feel optimistic that eventually the day will come when Ukraine receives an invitation to join the club 
and will no doubt greatly contribute to the Euro-Atlantic security. Ladies and gentlemen, some colleagues of mine say that Lithuania is one of the most pro-American countries in Europe. I take this as a compliment and as proof that our shared values lead us on the path of common, vision-grounded, and strong transatlantic bonds. Being a new EU member state, we are also amongst the keenest to put it bluntly, to keep the Americans in Europe. I believe Europeans and Americans can complement each other in so many ways. We sometimes forget how important we are to each other. We keep spending our time looking back at the things that divided us and doing soul searching instead of looking forward and working for mutual benefits. Today, EU can be proud of bringing a major soft power in the world. It is by far the world's biggest humanitarian aid donor. With new members joining, its influence will be even greater. On the other hand, in the past, we Europeans were often too slow in responding to the threats posed to world peace. From Kosovo to Bosnia to Darfur, Europe's actions were efficient when the transatlantic link was activated. Therefore, the United States and Europe should together define challenges and solutions before each declares its own way. This is not a question, not about fellowship, but about true partnership and common values. Whether it is Iran's ambition to build nuclear weapons, the peace process in the broader Middle East, or the consolidation of democracy in the Black Sea region, our agenda should be based on consensus and marked by swift and timely actions. As Senator McCain said last year in Brussels, speaking about the partnership of the US and Europe, we have to define their policies not just by what we stand against, but also by what we stand for. And I believe that we all stand for the future of the world's democracies. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the last point of my speech, energy, security, and transatlantic energy policy. It is argued that energy is so important that it must be treated differently. National champions, vertically integrated energy monopolies, State-owned companies, all of them today, feature high in energy markets around the globe. Unfortunately, this also means that the economic surrounding energy transactions are not always transparent and rational. Sometimes, these transactions are governed by political preferences. It is no secret that energy cartels prefer energy islands instead of predictable energy as a commodity markets. The shortage of major electricity and natural gas suppliers and the lack of energy grids in Europe reinforce asymmetrical relations between producers and consumers. In the coming decades, energy security is no doubt to become a major issue due to energy scarcity, its insufficient use, lack of investments, and political manipulations. I would go as far as to say that competition of, for energy will emerge as a basis for future conflicts, as the new big players like China and India 
enter the market which has no spare capacity. Now, how do we respond to these developments in a comprehensive and common manner? Is there a prospect for transatlantic energy policy or should we tackle these problems each on our own? My first, my first point would be that the free market has to prevail against politics and not the other way around. This won't come easy. Four-fifths of world's oil reserves are controlled by governments through state companies, often lacking in investments and traditions of efficient management. We could make a similar case for the gas sector just as well. The EU and the United States face hard work ahead to convince producer countries that it is in their best interest to open up, let investments in, and operate under the market conditions. First of all, it concerns Russia, whom we ask to ratify the Energy Charter Treaty. Only then can we enjoy equal opportunities to invest and attract investments to Russia's energy sector that is in a dire need of major renewal. Second, talking to thir third countries is not enough to make us less vulnerable to energy shocks. <coughs> we have to craft common policies and will help us diversify supplies and reduce addictions to oil as the President Bush put it last year in his State of the Union address, or lower the demand of nat for natural gas. For example, the US and Europe have to work together to build supply networks from the Caspian Sea region and bring countries like Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan to the world and European markets. It is important to open up those resources, not only from geostrategic point of view, but also from the advancement of democracy in the region between the Black and Caspian Sea. Enhancing energy partnership today is a major element of the European Union neighborhood policy and a clear indication of its significant to overhaul European security and economy. By having more supply options, we will be able to have more freedom and competition. But it also works the other way around. By integrating the economies of energy producers in transit countries, we will create new security and political partnerships that will spill over to other sectors of the economy and trade. This will equally lead to political stability and economic consolidation of the Caspian and Black Sea region. And I can tell you that Lithuania works hard to give energy security a greater prominence on the European strategic agenda. I have always stressed that, first of all, we need to speak in a single European voice on energy matters and upgrade the common EU energy policy. Without it, we will continue to the awful tradition of waiting for New Year surprises when gas or oil supplies are cut off to EU customers due to their Russian way of negotiating the price of oil or gas with its neighbors. And I believe that the latest developments proves that kind of a pol policy and, and provisions. Energy and its grids are vulnerable, not only by government's interference. Supply networks are potential targets for terrorists who can disrupt the economies for the entire region. Here NATO has to come in and work with its global partners and review its inter 
internal commitments how to respond to such crisis. Crisis prevention and crisis management in this area have a lot of room for mutual actions. Ladies and gentlemen, in this context, I would like to touch on the topic of Russia, since it is of high relevance to the region that I come from. What policy should the transatlantic community adapt towards Russia? A country that is absolutely critical in addressing our energy needs. Russia likes to declare that it is a reliable, reliable partner, which we all would like it to be, just as the US and Europe need each other, we need Russia to stand with us and help address global challenges. And let us not make a mistake. Today's Russia differs profoundly from what it was 10 years ago. Russia's growing middle class, stabilization and growth of economy are positive developments. <clears throat> but there is also an erosion of democratic freedoms, decentralization of power in the hands of the Kremlin, harassment of foreign investors, corruption, and organized crime. This has led many in your country to believe, including the independent task force of the Council on Foreign Relations, that Russia is heading in the wrong direction. I would say that today Russia faces a strategic choice. Will it become a part of the system of democratic states of Europe? Or will it choose to remain outside inventing a special kind of the so-called sovereign democracy? On many important questions, Russian policy looks unworkable and extremely selfish. Its national interests are often considered as prevailing over the legitimate interests of its Eastern European neighbors. On certain issues, Russian policy looks openly confrontational, especially when it uses energy as a weapon to obtain economic and political gains that are counterproductive to rational cooperation and good neighborly relations. I am certain that the transatlantic community has to be absolutely honest and speak out that only a democratic Russia linked to Europe by natural, cultural, strategic, and economic ties will have a greater say in Euro-Atlantic affairs. Relations that are built on a coincidence of interns have never been particularly stable. We should engage today's Russia and lay the foundation for working with the democratic Russia of tomorrow. There is much more that we can add to our cooperation beyond trade in energy resources. The peaceful resolution, resolution beyond trade and, and uh, frozen conflicts will be a litmus test whether the major breakthrough in our relations is possible. It is in the interest of everyone, including Russia, that countries in the east of Europe forge closer trade, economic, and security ties with the Euro-Atlantic community. The history of a double-track policy that embraced NATO and EU enlargement in good neighborly relations with Russia has already proved its success. We should continue on the same path when gradually integrating Ukraine, Georgia, or Moldova into Euro-Atlantic cooperation networks. And ladies and gentlemen, there are almost no international security challenges that the European, European Union or the United States face separately from each other. This makes me believe that nations sharing values and common interests makes natural partners. There is an important role for the political leadership. There is a moral obligation for Europe and the United States to promote the enlargement of a democratic <coughs> community. If we succeed, 
tyranny, poverty, and intolerance will give way to prosperity, mutual understanding, and shared responsibility for world affairs. With global challenges come global responsibilities. In the course of history, Europe and the United States have learned that achieving our own security does not always make conflicts go away in a neighborhood. But we also have learned that some things never change, and I have in mind transatlantic alliance of values that we treasure. With this in mind, I am sure that European Union and the United States will remain key drivers of this global and open community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, President Adamkus. Uh, uh, you're available for uh, answer a few questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes, and uh, please state your name and affiliation uh, uh, before you do so. Well, we got lots of hands. We'll start off with this gentleman right here. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Andrei Piankowski. I'm Hudson Institute Visiting Fellow. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this week your neighbor, uh, President Lukashenko, made several very interesting statements uh, uh, about a uh, possible new course of his uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, his intention to reach out to European Union is very clear and understandable in the context of his uh, uh, current problem with Moscow. <coughs> uh, to your view, what would be the best strategy of European Union on uh, reacting on such, uh, on Mr. Lukashenko approaches? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I am completely aware of this changing situation a little bit, which, as you indicated, the Russians are not giving Ken on his demands, and negotiations are going definitely almost to the dead, dead, dead end. So he's looking, I mean, he's practical. He recognizes if he's going to give in to Russian demands and prices, and this is going actually to destroy even now very shaky economy in this country. So what he's trying to do right now to tell the, at least the European Union, look, I mean, we differ, but we are not a, such a bad guys that you should actually punish us completely. So there is a way for you actually to help us out with the deliveries of energy he needs, the oil specifically, at uh, using the different routes, then you are going to actually to prove, I mean, that you really care about that individual, the common man, which uh, we definitely representing them. You have a very wrong picture about us, we are trying to introduce the democracy in our country and now prove it to us that you're really willing to have us in, our, in your Western community. So he's a playing very, very interesting games. I mean, he is just pulling on Russia a little bit, saying, look, I mean, if you are not going to give in to our demands or needs, let's put it this way, then we will find a way, I mean, to go around and to, you can go your own way, and we are going to our own way. To me, it's, there is no surprise. At the same time, we probably fulfill some missions. I was from the very beginning, because Lithuania has the longest common border with Belarus. And definitely, we directly feel, I mean, what's going on in a country over there. We follow that with great concern. We are taking certain steps, I mean, as we said, to introduce some oxygen for the opposition, which is not very strong at the, still at the present time. But we continu continuously stated to our Western democracies, our partners, we cannot shut off completely Belarus, because then Lukashenko definitely is going to win. It will be the the worst dictatorial regime, I mean, remaining in, in Europe. So we have to find the ways, I mean, sometimes 
not to, I mean, just give in to, to his ways, to, the way he is running the country, but uh, try to, wherever it's possible, to open up some avenues. Tell, okay, we are going to deal with, with your people, with your opposition, with the people who definitely don't like, I mean, what he is doing in the country. And at the same time, probably we will just keep the hopes and the strength of the opposition. So I am for it. I mean, if there is a way to do it, a little bit to indicate to them that we are definitely not against the people, but we are against the regime, we should do it. And uh, one thing, I mean, I believe, let me tell me from my own experience talking to him directly, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I spent with him about an hour and a half. You know, after that hour and a half, I thought that I'm speaking probably to the best human right protectors in the world. He almost convinced me. He was all for the democracy, for the free speech, for the rights of the human beings, and so on. But uh, 15 minutes later, we faced the press conference together. It was one of the largest I ever attended. And he forgot, I mean, what he was telling about 15 minutes ago to me. He was blasting the capitalists. He was imperialists, and even forgot I'm sitting next to him over there. And he just was sh shouting at that uh, Lithuania is just part of it, entire clan. So how can you trust that man? Definitely, he is not the one to be trusted. I can reassure you that in my eyes, he's not a Democrat. He doesn't care about the democratic values. But at the same time, he is just now pushed against the wall. How far he is going to do it, I don't know. But I'm still, I mean, the basic principle which I feel uh, that we should find a way to show the Belarus people that we are definitely don't want to shut them off from the rest of the world. And if there is a way to, to help them, let's do it. And when he closed the humanitarian university in Minsk last year, the OI decided to take a chance. And we opened up that university faculty entire in Vilnius providing, I mean, the opportunity for professors we provided a facility, and about, we have about 800 students from Minsk right now studying in Vilnius. So far, so good. We thought, I mean, that he can take some certain actions or pressures or whatever, but everything is quiet for a while. Oh, yeah. One more question. Yes, right here. Thank you, Mr. President, for coming. Um, my name is Jennifer Bover. I'm with the Energy Program at CSIS. Um, when you speak about talking to Russia as a partner in energy, it seems that Europe would have to have some kind of reciprocal leverage in order with which to, to discuss with them. Um, and in order to do that, it seems that Europe would have to have other options besides oil and gas. As the most nuclear-reliant country in the world, what is Lithuania doing to promote alternative energy <coughs> sources in Europe? You are absolutely right. And uh, Lithuania is in a... I would say in a special position right now because, as you will know, we have a two Chernobyl-type reactors built during the Russian times. And uh, Lithuania has committed itself by entering into the European Union to close those two reactors by 2009. The number one reactor has been closed as scheduled by 2005. Five, and uh, another one is still operating. I would, uh, can reassure you this is... Nothing left from the Chernobyl-type reactor because with the government of Sweden, who spent a hundred million, probably and even more, it has been rebuilt. Nothing left except probably the name of, of, of the construction at that time. It was built during the Chernobyl time, uh, times, and uh, at, and uh, it was reassured by international commission that it's safe to operate probably in 2025. But we have agreed to do it. We are working in that direction. But at the same time, we have decided to stay the nuclear state as far as the energy is concerned. And we, right now, a couple months ago, we have 
signed the agreement between Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, and last week even Sweden indicated that they would like to join by building the new, most modern nuclear reactor in Lithuania to provide I mean, insufficient, uh, insufficient and independent I mean, energy source for the future and to uh, open up, I mean, actually, the link between that from the Scandinavia all the way through Lithuania, through Poland, providing the energy to the Western and even the Southern Europe, because the demand is there, and we definitely feel, I mean, that this is an answer to that <coughs> future development of even a building up the quality of, of standard of life in that part of the Europe. So. We are moving ahead. I believe by 2012, we will be able to open up the third and most modern, efficient, latest technology operation, operational institution in Lithuania. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we've uh, unfortunately run out of time. Uh, before I close the, the meeting, uh, can I just make a small announcement? Could the audience please remain seated until the president and his party uh, are able to leave the room? So um, I would like to uh, wish uh, President Adamkus the best on his trip here and his country, all of them the best of success as they continue to integrate into the EU and NATO and uh, uh, that they are able to deal with their large neighbors uh, in a very effective manner.